uh, go ahead. Great. Welcome everyone to today's Design in Dialogue. We are really honored to have James Wines here today. Um, today, uh, we'll be recording this for archive purpose and we'll also put it on Vimeo shortly after. Um, we are also muting everyone to ensure audio clarity. So if you want to ask James any questions, we encourage you to type them in the chat box um, and we'll go through them during the Q&A. Um, let's turn to Glenn Adamson. Thank you, Lucy, and good morning, everyone out there, and good morning to you, James. Good morning. Great to see you. It's a true privilege and honor to have you with us on Design and Dialogue. Just to repeat something Lucy said there, if you have a question for James, and how could you not, please add it to the chat box, and we'll get back to you um, in the last 15 minutes of the conversation this morning. And also, we have a kind of new tradition here why don't you just go ahead and say hello for, from wherever you are, because we are very curious to know who is tuning in and who's listening. Um, and James, uh, you are coming to us from New York City, is that right? Yeah, correct. Good. And you're safe and sound in your quarantine. I, oh, oh, boy. It's well, a, I can't walk anyway, so it isn't that much of a difference, but it's just not being able to get to the office at all. Yeah. It's yeah. a strange time, and I wonder whether your feeling is that uh, something, anything will come out of this that is positive? Do you have any optimism? To well, share? you know, I'm kind of thinking you're going to redesign the world because it has to be. I mean, there's going to still be an you know, endless group of people who are fearful and then there's some another that want to get together or how it has to get together. So mm. It's going to be a new architecture, new everything. Yeah. So, new online architecture, new physical architecture. Yeah. Shall we start? Yeah, let's go ahead and start. So uh, if you go ahead and share your screen, James, and we'll be able to see your images. Uh -oh. And, um, you know, the plan today is a little different because James has kindly put together a short lecture for us, which will be 25 minutes or a half an hour. And he's just going to go through a lot of images, um, including many images of his own work with site sculpture in the environment, the avant-garde art architecture group that he co-founded. Um, and so he's going to share thoughts about his career and also sh uh, share thoughts about the practice of architecture as critical commentary. So James, take it away. All right. Um, well, I, as I say, this is a, a strange new world we're dealing with here. So what I'm going to do is, is just uh, flick through quickly uh, a kind of an overview of the situation we're in and we find ourselves in today. You know, all of the conflicts, and there's a lot of basic problems with architecture. But since it's, uh, I'm talking about commentary or communication, uh, I'm very interested, and I always have been, in how buildings and public spaces actually reach out to people. Do they, do they, for example, having lived in Rome, I was very aware that the, the environment spoke to me and I spoke to the environment. We had a discourse, we had an environment. And that isn't always true of buildings today. Uh, yeah, among the you know, massive problems we have, of course, the overpopulation. 68% uh, of the people, about 250, will be in cities. In 1900, only 16%. And we also have this whole rich world, poor world, where it, 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 it's such a gap now that it, it's staggering. We also you know, have to think about you know, the paradigms that we're building. All cities are becoming exactly alike. <clears throat> it's, it's all these mega towers, and you know, and of course, these people say the height of vanity. Why developers lie about the size of their erections? And and I think that a bunch of under endowed uh, macho men who you know fill this world, Trump in particular, even uh, Stormy Daniels made comments about uh, you know the equipment of our president. And of course, he is one of the candidates for trying to build the next world tallest power. Uh, another issue is today is, of course, the computer, the fact that we're swamped by uh, the, the exotic shapes you can make with a computer. In fact, that's become a kind of a, another cliche. You know, you're, you're building assets some wiggles or some, some convolutions that shows that you can use your computer well. Uh, but it's interesting. There's so many books on CAD and, and computer operations and uses <clears throat> and it's always amazing especially to cover this book that they that they're using the computer to generate shapes that were popular in the 1950s you know sculptors were making this kind of 
technological or, or organic shapes. And, you know, why use a computer for that reason? I mean, you, you, here's, for example, kind of a cross section from the 1950s sort of sculpture, and it's either high tech or organic or, you know, I'm certainly formalist abstract design. And uh, what's so interesting, I always wonder why, can, why architects today don't, don't, as the you know, industrial age architects were influenced, why aren't architects today influenced by either ecology, which is of course a system, and on all the digital imagery. I mean, this is the imagery of our time, and, and this is not. Uh, so another aspect that I want to you know, just mention today is the fact that <clears throat> even in this, this uh, distancing world that we're living in now, the, the coronavirus situation, uh, people really were taking to the streets with more vigor than ever, you know, and people were taking not only their political agendas, <clears throat> but their, their social agendas, and they were really taking, making the street, making the t-shirt, for example, into a form of communication. And so it shows that these are all things that architecture isn't doing. I'm just fine bringing them up. I, I, you know, I'm uh, particularly encouraged by the shirt in the lower right there. Fat people aren't easy to kidnap, so that helped me a lot. But anyway, there's a session of communication. And you know, now, of course, we're obsessed by computers because of the uh, social distancing. But it isn't really the way people like to live. I mean, there's another level of this going on. And so the question I'm kind of asking today, to what degree can architecture, public space, landscape design serve as conduits for social, psychological, political, and contextual messages? Usually those are not part of architecture. Architecture is formal or structural or economic or functional or that has some other asset which it advertises. Uh, historically, of course, there was not that problem. I lived in Italy a long time and uh, you know, in France, and I was constantly exposed to buildings where they could communicate messages. I mean, uh, Sharp Cathedral was just encrusted with messages that, you know, delivered sculpturally, but they're actually messages. Whereas in today's churches, it's either kind of abstract form or it's no iconography at all. And the same with our streets. I mean, you know, in a funny way, the world is built for social distancing because people do it anyway because it's a, you know, there's these kind of elaborate towers often, but the base around the kind of pedestal sculpture is, is nothing but acres of concrete. And it's also a reason that, the, you know, young people really can endeavor so vigorously to put their identity on buildings and, and, and public spaces. It's a compulsion of our time. As I say, having lived in Italy and where, you know, the quality of life is something like Piazza Navona, and then you go to places like Millennium Park or Hudson River Parkway, uh, the Park Fountain. Uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, the, the, look, at, look at the uh, Bernini Fountain, which is rich, I can, I can, rich communication, and the, you know, Hudson River Park, one looks like sort of guilty urination or something. It's, it's really kind of nothing. So, Looking at 20th century, 20th century architecture, we realized it was, it was un, unlike our digital era. It was influenced heavily by factories and, and industrialization and, you know, produces was and plan. Uh, very typical, it became the, again, this prototype or this now total paradigm for cities where you have massive towers, massive slabs of concrete, and the vegetation is a little fluff in the foreground. So, and, and then we carry on to the next generation. These, I'm just mentioning these sorts of things. Modernism and constructivism are the two most influential uh, uh, kind of types or styles uh, going on today. But when you see them, these, these, these could, could have been done yesterday. If you look at you know, an architectural magazine, it's this kind of formalism and that kind of attitude. In fact, here's uh, City of the Future, Chernikov, in 1931, here's Rem Kuhlhaus in 1998. So the paradigm is the same, and, and it, whatever the communicative message is, it's the same. So you build something like uh, Le Defense in Paris, and basically it's, it's perfect for social distancing because it is in fact, everyone in the plaza there looks like a little ant running. So the problem is, you know, going back again to Rome, this is a 
Christian, and a, as, a, as a real iconography, something like Trevi Fountain, which attracts hundreds of thousands of people per year, and then all these rather new public spaces that it's surrounded by where you don't see much action at all. Uh, and, and, and so what I wanted to do is, I just wanted to do that little preface because to set up the kind of issues that we're dealing, and then the kind of issues that we, that architecture could deal with in communication so far. Well, anyway, our tradition, I'm just, I've got to have to show, you know, set of iconic examples and, and quickly because this is a short discussion today, but, you know, we started in a commercial architecture world, but I just want to also show the, the, my colleagues in architecture, you know, driven by Ted, I mean, the image is that, that, to that, to that, this is kind of sites work in uh, integrating architecture, art, paving, everything. Um, there's a really a different texture from that to that. And it, it's really, I guess to, to prove that I was all once a formalist in a sense, uh, I did sculpture in the beginning with kind of large concrete and steel, very architectonic sculptures when I got out of school. But I figured, filled up a lot of studio space with that. Uh, they were popular with architects because, uh, you know, again, the, the, the nice shapes, which were, ended up in plazas and parks and gardens and everything. And then uh, in the 60s, uh, mid 60s, started doing more environmental works so sort of integrated with the environment. But the, I just show this because this is sort of my early sculpture, even though it was, you know, very, constructivist influence and in a sense kind of old-fashioned. It was basically uh, dealing with architectonic and environmental issues. Another thing I'd, I'd like to do, which you know nobody does anymore all, is draw by hand because I can get an atmosphere in, 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 in the work. I can get a, sort of a feeling of the context of the space that I can't do with, with Ted. In fact, I had an exhibition just to show that I really do use computers. You know, as everyone does, but also it's a way you can integrate with hand drawing. Here's an exhibition I had of the, ret the retrospective of drawings. It was in an atrium, and so we had 3M company help us do a giant digital floor of one of my drawings, and so people were walking on the drawing. So it was drawing as an actual ambulatory surface. Uh, to show a little of my early work, uh, it's to say I'm really an environmental artist. I do architecture, I, I work in the architectural arena, but I'm primarily feel you know, myself as an <coughs> environmental artist. Here's the field, you know, what I call pop art of the turd in the plaza. These are a few of my phrases. And this is the view you know, of the ghost parking lot. And uh, the difference is, it's just showing the, the, the material across the top here, um, is that most visual art or sculpture, so-called, is installed in the environment. Well, I always like the idea of it being as the environment. And ghost parking lot is definitely as the environment. You couldn't possibly take this away and put it in a museum without a total loss of meaning. And so it was really just an as a bunch of cars covered with asphalt, asphalted over to make a total environment, a fusion of the two. And it, and it resulted, of course, in an iconic kind of sculpture, but it was a different point of view of sculpture. And it's also community oriented because, you know, if it's like it, it, it floating the atmosphere of, you know, a typical shopping center. Just to show kind of another automobile related one, a uh, Zuzu Car Company uh, Commission site to do a children's park for young people in um, the Yokohama Railway State. It's actually on the other side of the station. And the client asked us, he wanted some representation of the Japanese garden. He wanted, he loved outer space, and of course they wanted to celebrate the Isuzu car. So what we did was we populated this entire plaza with a Japanese family. We, we cast them from life into fiberglass, and they were mounted upside down. So the floor plane or the ground plane was where the foot level came. And here you see some of the casting process, casting people, and then installing them. And Isuzu loved this idea of having their transmission, their new version of transmission showing. So it became a park, you know, of, with another floor plane or another ground plane. And of course, children loved it. It was perfect for children because they could jump on their 
father's feet, you know, playing in the garden. Uh, so start with architecture a little bit more. Uh, we started in a kind of junk world uh, with the, um, you know, that's father's company's big box stores. They were getting a lot of complaints that the store, they were big art collectors, but they, their stores were not cracked, they were interesting. So this is the first building, but it was again dealing with architecture as a kind of critique of architecture. It was making fun of it, it was having, uh, it, it, there was humor obviously involved, but it was basically uh, saying that really buildings in process or in evolution are far more interesting than they are when they're finished. And that is pretty true. We did a series of set of buildings. We did a moving building that was act activated by, by motors so you could open the, the, like the jigsaw puzzle, close up, you could open it for the customers. But it was interesting because unlike the shed, which is also a moving building, a recent example of a moving building, that is primarily functional and, and, and the values are sort of formal here. On this, in this particular case, you see you had the advantage not only of, of moving building, people stood still while the building moved, but you ended up with a, a public sculpture, a public space, and a building. So you had all three, you got the benefit of all three, which is, again, another jigsaw puzzle building, just taking the building apart in space so you, you can address the building at any scale you, you choose, you feel comfortable with. This is a kind of a deconstructivist thing where you're really commenting on structural systems. And again, it entertained people and it also, uh, you know, said something. In fact, a, a lady, you know, felt it, I guess, felt this is such a realistic thing. She asked me on open day, well, how do you expect me to get up to that door? But anyway, part of this whole idea was to keep everything absolutely minimal, any extra, you know, it were too much. I always believe in economy of means and keeping the big box store intact was to keep the iconography of that world and at the same time uh, change it completely. We, we did inside outside building where you're selling ready not only the products but the, the, the whole what is inside that you never see. And as you say, it came through the thermal glass, you can see that little fire engine there and it came through the thermal glass and was ghosted on the outside, they were cast into the room, and then real on the inside. So, and, you know, um, it's unlike conventional product display, and the children, of course, love this idea. The bicycle literally going through the thermal barrier. So on one, one side, it's a sort of a surreal experience, on the inside, it's a real experience. And also, uh, you know, the company center was some, an inside, outside building, but it was primarily formalistic in the sense that these were all made form. For, our idea was just to open it up and reveal both inside and outside simultaneously. Well, anyway, the idea is that we're treating architecture really well, and sculpture simultaneously as a kind of roadside event. You'd see it from a passing car and it became the subject matter of art. So architecture becomes a subject matter instead of a design process. And then it was placing art where people would least expect to find it. And that was the kind of the joy of the whole thing is putting art where where it isn't expected. When the series began to get more environmental, we did a forest building in Virginia, which was uh, totally absorbing that we actually weren't allowed to build there. And so finally we convinced the committee we'll build a, a shopping center, but we'll keep all the trees. So we kept the trees, as you can see. And so it's interesting, again, it's an inside outside building. Uh, if you go from outside to inside, but you're still outside to go inside. So there's layering. Also, we layered it since it was on a hillside. We made a terrarium wall out of it instead of, you know, a typical landscape design is always on top. It's not on the ground as well. So uh, in Florida, we uh, had the same situation. We we're trying to preserve an existing landscape. So we put it in the building at, behind glass and, and, and it's a rainforest. So it's, it's a, a recycled water flowing down the front of the building. It kept the building cool. Oh, it, it was very good in reducing air conditioning, but it also became a kind of magical experience as you're driving down the highway to see the whole the landscape in the building and, and they're almost shimmering at the same time. This is just a theoretical project, but it's, it's the kind of thing we work on a lot at site. We're looking at situations where you know, something should be done 
And again, that's this big tower in the concrete and the condo and the suburban sprawl and all of these things where people have no identity. So we designed a kind of like what we call an identity and density uh, situation, you know, kind of based on Marcel Duchamp's uh, idea of can chance. And there's a matrix and then the matrix, in, within the matrix, the, the citizens are allowed to establish their own identity, which was a very popular idea. I mean, we, we exhibited it quite a bit around the world. Uh, but you can see the difference. There's, an entire, again, an entirely different texture to a building where the citizens and the inhabitants are able to achieve their own identity. It's not just the architect deciding for them. We did parks and gardens. Uh, this is where the, the whole park was based. This is in Chattanooga, where the, it was based on the city grid, but then the city grid breaks up and as it gets near the Tennessee River. So there was an old canal that we broke up to create the situation. But it invited people, you know, the, the rolling up of the paving, children uh, could play in the fountains or in the broken paving. There was a thermal wall, was a water wall covered the offices of, of the uh, aquarium there, and so people could see children playing wherever it was. Well, that ended our period of green architecture. I wrote a book on green architecture. And I'm going to show you this project. This, is, this one was specifically, it's an art. Uh, foundation in uh, with Lake Como in Italy. And it's, you know, there's a monastery on the hill, there are a lot of surrounding walls. So we decided to make this a building where everything in the building would be uh, gathered from within a 10 kilometer radius, including the glass. So there's a glass factory there as well. The idea being that you, once you're living in all that transportation, we were doing something in, in favor of ecology. We also took the wall system, as you can see, we put in that drawing, we just extended the wall system that was already there and just made the building out. We also added uh, T-shaped uh, columns, cast stone columns, so that we can make all kinds of sculpture bases and, um, you know, just structure, part of the structure of the building. So you can see that when the building is done, it, it, the idea is to integrate it to the maximum degree into its context on the hillside. And so it's really basically absorbed by the environment. We call it nature's revenge, uh, where the environment becomes a building, the building is the environment. And the idea is just it should grow into such an extent that eventually the building all becomes almost invisible. This is just showing some of the columns used. They were used very casually throughout the property, say making sculpture bases, making you know, connections to the property, making the entrance way. So in a way that the actual buildings spread out all over the property, everywhere within the property, you could sense that you were there at the foundation because of the iconography inside with a glass stairway. So you could see out all sides. This is, uh, you could see the Swiss Alps from uh, this building. So it's really a beautiful view. This is opening day. And so you can see again, here, the idea was, that's a monastery in the background, was to totally integrate with the context and make a maximum green building. Actually, the, there's an underground uh, video art section. Uh, this is a pavilion, basically, for the curator and for the guests, you know, there's a restaurant and so forth. But the idea was to, to totally fuse it so it almost looked like it grew naturally, like a plant right out of the environment. So more recently, we have dealt with a lot of projects dealing with the idea of nature's revenge and the fusion of context, and also like, communicating that fusion. Uh, just to show us the last little thing, uh, you know, because we're dealing with product design a lot as well. This is one we did for Foscarini in Italy, which, you know, the light bulb is still iconic and people prefer it over the uh, LED light, even though light bulbs are not LED lights. But the world has returned, as you know, very much to the old fashioned light bulb because they like the shape. So we did a whole series and kind of inverting it like the black light. So the, the series black and melting and split and candlelight and a terrarium light and light within the light within the light. And this is a series. But the, the interesting part of it is we talked about using the computer age. This became, because it was an upside down exhibition that was inverted, uh, people loved to come and take their pictures in this and then send them around the world via Instagram. 
So it is a it was a form of communication. People couldn't all be there. Plus the form of communication, just as we're working with computers today, and the coronavirus period is it communicated to the world. And so just to conclude, I, a very, a very, I always like Duchamp, who said, I'm not, I'm interested in ideas, not in the visual products. And the problem architecture has is the physicality. And, uh, but it, Duchamp said, well, you know, I'm non-visual, but it didn't mean you didn't see it. It just means he wasn't, you know, capitalizing on traditional values in, in art. He was changing the art and context. And I think it's a good mission for the world. I mean, this is again, sites kind of integrated world. And we're still pursuing this, obviously. This is, a, we really feel that whatever you do should spread into the context. And the context of the world. And that's the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, James, for that whistle stop tour through your thoughts and work. That was absolutely spellbinding. And I'm so glad that this is being archived on the Friedman Venda site so people will be able to refer to it. So there's yeah. so much there. Um, I have a lot of questions. I'm sure other people will too. So we'll just talk for about 15 or 20 minutes and then um, let others pose their questions. Um, the first question I have for you is really about the poetics of Sight's work. And I'm curious about this image of the ghost and the idea that something has happened at this place before and that thing is maybe over or you're presenting people with some kind of temporal image of tilting or ruination. Yeah, yeah it is. It's really a commentary, not only on what is generally built. I mean, we use a lot of, you know, we broken and fractured and split and we use a lot of words that are not really part of the general vocabulary of architecture, simply because, again, I think with any art almost, it's what invades it from the outside that makes it interesting. If you're really only interested in form making or shape making or painting the picture or something, you know, with, with a classic value, that's perfectly, that's great. I mean, it can be done beautifully, but we always like the idea of some kind of inversion, some kind of, where it made you think about something else. I always considered, for example, the highest compliment I, I think I, in my history was always to do something and, then somebody would come, come up to me and say, my God, I never thought about a building before. So that was the idea, to activate some kind of dial. Mm. So the communication became the, the big event. Uh, it, it, as I say, it's a new world, it's sort of tense now, because on one hand, we're going to have to create spaces that are for this social distancing. At the same time, there's a radical need for buildings and spaces to communicate, because people are still trying to do business. And then there's this whole idea of just a psychology of the situation. The people have lost their identity in the environment. They are kind of herded by sheep through public spaces and doorways. And I mean, for example, would you ever go to Upper Sixth Avenue for any other reason except you have to have a job there? That's the only reason. No one would ever go there for any kind of exaltation or reward or dialogue or anything. Mm. It makes me think of the phrase that you used on one of the most famous best facades, which is the one where the bricks tumble down into a kind of avalanche, which you call the indeterminate facade. And that word has always interested me, indeterminacy, as a principle in your work. Yeah. Well, I think that I share that with, because I, I do like reading about sciences, and I'm very interested in number of subjects. But what I showed today is it's just the tip of the iceberg of all the areas that I've been interested in and sort of done work in in those areas. But um, yeah, indeterminacy is always gonna be interesting. I don't know if there's no answer. I think it was Samuel Beckett who said, art has no obligation to make things clear. Mm -hmm. And it's true. It, 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 it's make you ask questions more than to clarify something. Yeah. Do you think that the image of the ruin in particular is um, has a special relationship to that? Because it makes me think about you know, the idea of wandering through a building that's lost its purpose. And I particularly wonder about that in the context of late 20th century architecture, obviously the postmodern context, which often had this quality of either dystopianism or ruination to it. Well, I would say, you know, I, I, I always kind of resisted this you know, falling buildings thing because it isn't really about that. It's really about process. It's really about questioning architecture or asking the question. And to use a fragmentation is just 
just kind of came naturally. I would say that, you know, calling our buildings, uh, you know, falling buildings or destroyed buildings is, you know, just about as perceptive as looking at a Giacometti sculpture and tell, saying it's about starving people. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's just not. It really isn't about that, you know. It, I mean, it's, like I said, the appearance in some of them has that ruined look, but it, it wasn't, it isn't the main idea. So would you say that it's, it's not so much an image of ruination, it's more an image of perhaps openness? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, just a way of questioning. That's mm -hmm. it, it's using uh, psychological and sociological and other, other kinds of input to ask, ask these questions. Yeah, um, just on that point of the, um, the commentary and criticism that's embedded in your work. I wonder if you could say a little bit about architecture as having particular opportunities and challenges in that regard. Because on the one hand, it's out there in public space where people can see it and you showed wonderful images of people interacting with your work. But on the other hand, you have clients who quite literally represent vested interests that are making it possible for you to work in a way that a painter or sculptor is not necessarily directly contingent on. And I wonder how you think about architecture's political uh, opportunities and difficulties in that light. Well, obviously, whatever the assignment is has a lot to do with the result. Uh, you know, as I say, we've done a wide variety of things. I, I, I think the consistent element of it is absorbing some aspects of context. But, uh, but, you know, people always ask, well, how do the best people ever agree to do that? Because they're outright making fun of their business. It's, it's a form of, you know, actual humor, caustic humor in a particular, you know, economic genre, really. And, but they were big art collectors. Actually, in the beginning, that goes sparking about and all of our early clients who were, in fact, art collectors. So they already understood that doing something self-effacing in the public domain actually won customers. It didn't repel them, it won them. And uh, so uh, it's amazing that more, more commercial people don't realize that because, I mean, and, and just think of someone like Elvis Presley, all of his performances, he knew he was great, but he didn't make that point. But he was always doing self-effacing things. You know, mm -hmm. great performers do that. And, uh, so, uh, Little Richard, I mean, everybody can think of, they were always both, you know, doing their art, but they were always doing something self-effacing with it, which made it entertaining and interesting, and would leave the audience of that tension of watching that some genius do this thing in front of your eyes. Mm. So I think that, I, I like that self-effacing quality, and I think the clients, the art clients, I think in many cases did. I guess we should say just for the record that the clients for the best stores were Sydney and Francis Lewis from Richmond and their art collection is now at the MFA uh, yeah. in, or in Richmond, the museum. And, yeah, it's a spectacular collection. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, uh, Sydney and Francis Lewis are unique in the world of art collecting. Also, mm -hmm. I think their sociability, their, their ability to reach out to people and try to yeah. take daring chances. I, I remember when I first presented the indeterminate facade at a kind of a he was hosting a corporate meeting, and uh, everybody, everybody, they said, if you build a building like that, no one will come into it. And they gave all, he wrote down, you know, Sidney was writing down all these little notes about why, why he shouldn't do it, you know, all the things that he said. And then he said, well, James, after the meeting, just stay around for a little while, I'm going to talk to you. So the minute that all the other guests left, he said, okay, let's get started. <laughs> <laughs> And he tossed the list in the rice basket, basket. So, and how did the best stores actually perform as a commercial proposition? Did you well, have a that? world famous almost overnight? So, it did very, very well. yeah. yeah. They're a big problem with advantage. Because I was thinking, okay. hello, uh -oh. hi, sorry, James. Can you just repeat that? The signal broke up for a second. Here, you're frozen. Are you are you all right? <laughs> Somehow, is it working? Yeah, it is. Go go ahead. Just repeat what you just said. Thanks. I, I can't remember what I just said. What were we talking about? Well, yeah. we were talking about the best stores and their in, instant fame. Oh, well, I I just said that you know Sydney Lewis after a meeting of, of 
colleagues saying that we should never do that building, that nobody will go in it. He just tore up the notes that he made and said, okay, let's get started. So he really had that spirit, that, 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 that sort of, uh, you know, very, very American and very optimistic and also uh, very much in the spirit of, of almost self-criticism as public, public art. You know, one thing that all, you, you did mention, but I wanted to ask you more about is the idea of a building as an image, which of course has become so important now in the age of Instagram and the way that architecture travels around instantaneously just as image and not as built experience. And I wonder whether you now look at your early work as having been prescient in that way. Well, we were certainly prophetic, you know, in terms of that kind of, you know, it was imagery, but it was still, most buildings are still, as I sort of noted in the beginning, because of CAD and because of what computers can generate in terms of shapes, are more or less exercises in abstract form and also um, just, uh, you know, a kind of, again, kind of an archetype that goes on and on. I mean, after modernism and constructivism, over a hundred years old now. And we have basically a dominant style, really, you know, based on that. Even the Beaux Arts only lasted about 30 years, and that was much disdained because of all that decorative excess. And now we have, you know, shapes, endless shapes. So after a while, you, you know, I always encourage young people try to think of something else, take another approach, mm -hmm. just find other levels of input. What, what other? Ideas, what, what can you borrow from? What in literature, what in the environment, what in ecology, what in nature, what, what else can you express that's more interesting? Mm -hmm. so that's kind of, kind of the, 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 my message, basically. But as, you're right, we, we could get in kind of early in this idea of using architecture for other reasons, or architecture as a subject matter. I think that's mm -hmm. the yeah. Do you have any um, theories to share with us as to why modernism and formalism do exert such a grip on the architectural establishment? Do you think it's just risk aversion or what? Well, I think it's risk aversion, but also the clients have gotten used to it. They, they, they found a way to, you know, it sort of depend on the dependability factor is very important for people. Again, I think, you know, people don't, I mean, especially developers and they don't like to so called take chances. They, they want assurance of income, assurance of, whatever. So a lot of that, that restraints are where they're not in visual art, they are in architecture. You, 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 you're compelled to keep within these guidelines and that's it's very, it's hard, to, that's why it's hard to work in. That, that's kind of what makes it enjoyable, but it's very, very difficult mm. to work within that, that framework. So working up against the friction yeah, of those the limitations. The restrictive aspect, in a sense, make the game more fun. Yeah, yeah. Can you say a little bit about how Site actually worked as an office? Because um, obviously you were a co-founder and, and very much a leader and spokesman, but you weren't a one-man show. No, we were we worked as a group. We had four partners in the beginning. And uh, at our highest, we were never big firm because we're always basically doing art projects and smaller projects. I think the biggest we ever got was about 40 people. Hmm. Uh, but after we were doing some big public space projects and things like that. So, but it, it, it would always work pretty much like an architectural firm. We, you know, we sat down at meetings and shared information, did site analysis, you know, we, we, you know, all of that, all those conventions, the, the way of working, I would say, would be typical of any. You know, small firm. Really. Mm. And, and was there a division of labor in terms of who did what? Well, I would say the four partners were kind of in charge of what's the idea here? What's going to happen? What, what, what are we going to look at? But I'd say the difference probably in our discussions, we were always looking for some, at some other source of interest. You know, we knew we could design the building. I mean, if, as you see from my sculpture, I'm perfectly capable of making shapes and forms and putting them together successfully. But, you know, after a while, you, in fact, Teaser, who was my mentor in the last years of his life and supported me a lot, uh, said, you know, to look at my sculpture, he says, oh, well, that's all very well, James, but, you know, that's abstract art is very old fashioned. Why should you do that? So you don't want to do that kind of thing. So he laid the guilt trip on me. I said, no, I guess I don't want to do that kind of thing. 
So I did get into other sources of ideas. I think that was good. And it, because in fact, abstract art is over a hundred years old as a, as a point of view. Now we have a lot of figurative art coming back, of course. But you know, that's sort of a big issue. Mm. Uh, you know, it's interesting to hear the mention of Frederick Kiesler, and I didn't realize he had had such an impact on you because I associate him in some ways with surrealism and the idea of architecture and dream space. And I yeah. wonder whether you think of that as one of the threads in your intellectual makeup. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I just wrote a, a long essay for a book on Kiesler in Europe, and uh, it, it just came out. It's a really great book. You can see it. You know, Kiesler and the Album Guard, but it's about his whole impact. But I find him the most interesting because he's always in the arena of ideas. Mm. He's a, a, an idea person. And he's always taking this kind of prophetic view of the future. And uh, everybody loved him. I mean, the funeral was just an extraordinary experience. Rosenberg did a painted tire and rolled it down the aisle. And, oh, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, with a Schoenberg with music. I mean, it was just incredible. And he said, before he died, he says, well, I want my, I don't want any weepy people at my funeral. I'm going to be laughing and happy. <laughs> no, he was an amazing person. Right. A big influence on all aspects of life. You know what, another creative uh, dynamo that I did want to ask you about following on from our interview with Alexandra uh, Cunningham Cameron on Wednesday about the Willie Ware, Willie Smith show at the Cooper Hewitt. And those who missed it, by the way, that archive uh, interview is on the Freeman Bender website. Yeah, I, 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 I looked at her. Oh, okay. good. Yeah. A, a very kind site. And I, I, yeah. Anyway, amazing. So but can you it. talk about working with Willie Smith? Uh, yeah, we talked a lot about working with Willie Smith. I mean, uh, uh, Alexander is definitely an ideal person. I mean, she is really into it. And uh, she has a bit of a battle too because she's working with all these conventions around it, just like architects, you know, these conventions kind of strapping her in. But she does an amazing job and she's exceptional, absolutely exceptional. Mm. And so what does this work with? But just to talk to him, this is, you know, our early discussions about Willie and his personality. You know, that, that, that part where they were talking about why isn't he more famous? Because he's extraordinary. Why isn't somebody like that more famous? Mm. You know, African American genius, really, and and you think this would be of all times to to celebrate that kind of person? I mean, why wouldn't it? Absolutely. What, what what was he actually like to work with? How was your exchange with him? Oh, well, he had, he had just one. Well, just the dialogue all the time, and he, that's why he worked with so many other artists. He found Noam Chomsky because he was always interested in ideas, and he wanted to have it in his work. He wanted to have it embedded in his work. He believed in the streetwear thing, but, uh, which was, you know, quite powerful. Now, of course, every big, you know, kind of plush designer, high-end designer has a streetwear line. Mm. Really, really started that. The idea where you, people everywhere could, could buy his clothes. You know? That's right. Um, I did want to, before we turn to questions, I wanted to just touch on a sadder subject, but I know that one that's very important to you, which is the passing of Michael Sorkin. So um, we've actually lost quite a few extremely significant people in the design field in the last month, but none more significant than Michael Sorkin, the great architecture critic. And I wonder if you could just offer a few words about him. Well, you know, Michael is unique. We're very close. You know, we're having dialogue about everything. And actually, there's going to be a ceremony tonight at six o'clock. Uh, I mean, there really aren't enough words. I can't say it in a few minutes because it was very complex. You know, not only was Michael very supportive, but we shared that sort of sense of irony about architecture in general. And he could always be on that critical edge all the time. Mm. And, you know, as a writer, he's sort of unparalleled. I mean, he really, you can read his writing or portrait. And uh, the fact that he had those qualities uh, all embedded in one person, I would say he was a kind of a Renaissance person. I mean, I don't know, in, in my career, and uh, it's just it, it's, I, every day I think about it for some reason and and miss that dialogue. Just mm. you know, and sometimes it's just a short note on the internet. Sometimes a whole evening long dinner, you know, discussing, and we we take on controversial issues. And again, it's so ironic that he, he's the ultimate 
kind of urban planner who, who wanted people to come together, just trying to work on every aspect, as am I, that we both have that as part of our mission in life. And now we're working with these guys at the height of social distancing. It's really weird. It's, it's sad and, and ironic. Yeah, you did write a, a tribute to him, I understand. Yeah, yeah there, it, it was in uh, Arthur. Yeah, yeah. Well, th that's something that people might certainly want to seek out. So thanks for offering those remarks on him. Um, I think we could now go to questions, if that's okay with you, James. Okay, sure. We have a few. Um, first, uh, I'd like to turn on this topic uh, to Joe Kai, who mentions Michael Sorkin in his question and has a question about the direct impact of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, Joe, are you with us? Yeah. Joe. Hi, Hi James. Hello. Hi, James Lines. Hi. Joe's hi from Beijing, <laughs> JLP. <clears throat> How are you doing? Yeah, good. I just asked you a question is about uh, uh, you know the Michael Sorkin is uh, we lost the best friend, you and yeah. also mine. So I, so my question is uh, also, I told you, I think it's changed because of the coronavirus and uh, I think the public space uh, is more and more important in the architecture, in the, in the nature, in the ventilation. So what's the change in the future? That's my question. I well, I, 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 I sort of mentioned it. Actually, my daughter, Suzanne, and I have talked about this a lot. And Michael, if Michael was living, he would be talking about this every day because there really have to be multiple worlds of architecture. You know, I think I talk about communication of subjects other than form. And there's that's one. Then there's obviously the integration of nature and the environment. And then the big question is what is going to be done about divided society? I mean, if people are going on forever now, from now on, you know, distancing themselves, preferring to stay in isolation, and able to do it because of computers. On the other hand, there are people who desperately need to be together, not only in their job, but just because of social need. We, we are that kind of creature. We have to assemble, we have to in, have an interaction. And as a matter of fact, in, 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 they were talking about the other day, the pubs in Ireland, have closed down. Well, the pub in Ireland is an ancient tradition of people have to come together every night in a pub. I mean, that's just part of their whole cultural structure. And so what are they gonna do? They're, they're gonna have to, there'll be a lot of people want to live separately, a lot of people want to live together. How, what kind of spaces and buildings will we be able to design that accommodate this complex uh, situation? I mean, that would be my answer. I have, I have no way to answer you, but it's a great question. It's a, it's a fundamental question, I think, of the future. A question we should because, all be asking. Because, yeah. because recently we uh, designed the Jesse City in New York City, and uh, the mm -hmm. client wants us uh, to do more and more public space. They want more to integrate to the nature. So that's the, the, the client request recently. Last, uh, last yesterday, we have uh, another com conference with them. They mentioned uh, about it. So that's why I asked your question. No, we, it's, it's, it's shown in my slides. There are a lot of buildings that are integrated with the environment. I mean, the one in Italy, the forest building. I mean, we've done a lot of things that integrated with the context that depended heavily on, on the inclusion of nature. Okay. Thank so thank you very much. That's uh, just returning to that concept of nature's revenge, which is, I think, one of the most productive and provocative things that you talked about, James. Um, can we now turn to the uh, ceramic artist Ashwini Bhatt, who has a question for us? I think coming from California, if I'm not wrong. Ashwini, are you there? Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Hi. <laughs> Hi, this was amazing. Thank you for everyone for putting this together. Um, from what I know, you came to architecture from sculpture. I wonder if that shift happened because you found the architectural practice more participatory. Um, just from the visuals we saw, um, the structures are so sculptural, but they are energized by 
people participating. Um, so I kind of wondered about that. Well, it's a perfect question. It's absolutely, you know, I try to never photograph our buildings without people. I, I, I think I, people interaction mm -hmm. is part of the raw material of architecture, I think. And the more they interact and the more they, they become part of it, uh, as, as performers and it's actually subject matter as well. I, I believe in that very, very strongly. And, and you know, I try to work that into the system. Again, I don't know, what are we going to do with this times we live in? Your generation is definitely have a lot to think about. Really, it's a sad but we have to think about. Mm. I think it's really true that your work has always, right from the beginning, uh, taken for granted its own actual inhabitation. It's not just an abstract gesture in space. It's really a humane it's environment. Always, everything you've done. Well, yeah. Something about the context, social, mm. psychological, physical, ecological, whatever, has been incorporated. You know, uh, you know it's really funny because architects still, and it's like architects are elected. It's just it's a guidebook for how to photograph architecture as a big sculpture sitting on a pedestal and God forbid a tree or a person and be in front of it. That's, a, that's their, you know, you know, photographic philosophy. <laughs> Just absolutely, the, I, I think the polar opposite. I really, hmm. I really do. The only thing, well, I guess the best though is the best scene from a roadway, but it was a roadway crowd, you know, in the sense of the roadway audience. Yeah. yeah, like Venturi and Scott Brown said, right? It's a landscape meant to be viewed at 35 miles an hour. Exactly. Right. Well, I wrote a very early essay called Notes from a Passing Car. Mm. It was just exactly that. Yeah. Let's turn next to Andrew Gardner, who has a question about the ghost parking lot. Andrew. Oh. Andrew, do we have you? Uh, oh, good. Hey, how are you? Good. Sorry, I couldn't, mute, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, Hi, James. This is Andrew from Andrew Gardner from MoMA. Uh, hope you're well. Thank you for a great lecture today. Uh, just wanted to um, hear a little bit more, if, or, uh, see if you could touch a little bit more on the Ghost Parking Lot project, how it came into being, um, and uh, thinking more kind of about the logistics, who the organizing commission was, or how, the, how uh, who actually commissioned you to make the project. And also thinking a little bit more about decay and, and how that project sort of um, uh, lived out or, or how it decayed over time. I wanted if, wondered if you could touch a little bit more on that as well, whether there's whether there's some sense of decay is inherent to the project itself. Yeah, uh, well, you know, both Bob Smith and I really believed in that sort of entropy thing. But I was done with the idea it would decay and then just be removed. That was it's like a spiral jetty. I'm trying to preserve it, but Bob's idea was it would just be absorbed back into the environment. And I, the ghost parking, I was sort of done with that same attitude in mind. It was just, you know, it was, it, it, it was the fun of, you know, cars consume you know, petroleum, but here was a petroleum product consuming the car. So there was that kind of ironic twist to the whole thing in the beginning. And then the shopping center owner was David Germain, a big art collector. Anyway. So he wanted, he loved the idea of doing it. And, um, the physicality of doing it was an event in itself. It was fun doing it. It went on for a couple of months, you know, gathering the cars and, you know, cleaning the other door, cleaning all the insides out and seal them so the water wouldn't, you know, damage too much. But uh, it was, again, it was a temporary thing. And, and you're right, you're absolutely right. It, it, and when it started to really disintegrate, you know, we, by that time, it became very famous project. So, we told David, okay, I'm just take it away. It's, it's not there anymore. So weirdly, I, he said he loved it so much he wanted to preserve it. So then he dumped concrete all over it. And so all of the detail was lost. You know, obviously, the thin layer of asphalt showed all that, you know, you know, rich detail, like like a, like a drapery, and it just became lumps. <laughs> so it, it 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 disintegrated by 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 imposition of. The patron himself. <laughs> oh, anyway, can I just ask a follow up to Andrew's question? Um, would you apply some of the same logic to your other architectural projects? Because, of course, many of the best stores are gone and there's a kind of ephemerality built into, I guess. Well, I don't know. I, again, I, 
in the past, I've talked to Christo about this. I've talked to, you know, earth artists about this. I mean, we all are, it's kind of nicer when nature does it, you know, and, or, or you just have to remove it like a crystal great building or something. But, uh, you know, now I really wish all, a lot of them were back because uh, that's the, you know, the kind of evil of the big box world. It, it, you know, every 10 years, they just tear everything down and build another mall. Mm. So that's anti-ecological already in the extreme. And to tear down perfectly good buildings that had so famous, uh, I'm surprised that, that, that there wasn't more of an uprising in certain communities, because the communities really were proud of it. They really mm. were. I mean, especially the Houston building was really, really famous. I would say one of the most reproduced buildings ever. Mm. And, uh, you know, you, you think the architectural community or somebody would say, oh, come on. In fact, I had suggested, because it was a, a, a very big Hispanic center where the building was, I said, well, why don't you take a, a Hispanic cultural center there? I just, you know, not do it for a shopping center, why not make, a, make it a museum? Make, make it a, you know, a cultural center. Mm. And you just repurpose it. And, and, but that doesn't happen. That's, that world is just voracious and it's the ability to destroy, sorry, sadly. Yeah. Well, that was a big part of the reason for your critique of the big box culture in the first place, I suppose. Yeah, sort of, yeah. It had, that was inherent. Well, let's turn now to Vero Smith, who has a question about uh, the rural spaces uh, and their, their imminent fate. Vero, are you with us? Yes. Hi. Hey, James. Nice to see you. you. Good. How are you? Hi from Iowa, everyone else. I'm in a rural place, a designer and an architectural historian here. So I feel like the rural is getting left out of our conversations of post-corona. Do you think there'll be an increased interest in places like where I live? Or is everyone going to be focused on urban renewal? How will this play out? Well, I don't know. Again, that's another huge question. Already they're, they're writing articles about them. just the number of people are moving out of New York or, or just selling their city residents and staying in the country because it is safer in general. And uh, I think that that's, you know, that's something we're dealing with. We're really dealing with that. Is that, um, I, I mean, it's going to probably, in a way, the end of the coronavirus or at least some, some kind of not what we call normalcy, when it returns, architecture will be the profession that almost everyone will look to for, some, for innovation and for change. They really will. It's, it's a huge obligation. And it's, it's interesting because you can't operate a computer, computer without it being in a building. So we're going to need buildings and we're going to need public spaces and we're going to need roads and gardens and forests. We need all of that. The earth can't, humanity can't exist without these things, but they're all going to take some kind of change. Mm. Cities may get smaller, who knows? You know, they're supposed to be getting bigger, as the quote at the beginning of my program here said. The UN says they're 68% now, I think, already. And uh, so they make shrink. You know, people just want to get away from it, not be so, so vulnerable. Mm. You know, um, I, we're just about out of time, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, read a last question to you, which is exactly what I was going to ask you, basically. And this comes from your former student, Anahita, uh, okay. who says that despite the obviously terrible side of the COVID crisis, um, it's a great opportunity to give in to people of the world to self-investigate and yeah. find deeper meanings, maybe see things from a different perspective. And um, the question is, do you think a renaissance might happen after this? Are you that optimistic? Well, I'm glad Anahit is optimistic. He's always an optimistic student. He's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I communicate with a lot of uh, students in Tehran. I, so I did a, a Skype lecture there a couple of months ago. Uh, it's going to be different. I, again, I, we can't predict how. But I really do think that all civilizations develop on, on needs. And, it, you know, we can't go back to being hunter-gatherers. But, but I think a lot of people will look back at that and say, hey, we were better off hunter-gatherers than we are as, as, you know, New York City residents in many ways. So I think that people are going to really think this through. I think it would be 
a renaissance of philosophy and probably a renaissance of ideas. Mm. I really do. I, I feel optimistic. I'm with Anna Heath on that. And uh, so. I, well, thank you. Thank you for that. You seem like a person to listen to to me. So I'm really glad you said that. <laughs> and uh, we're so grateful to you for uh, sharing the time and so many ideas with us this morning. I did want to uh, mention to folks that uh, on the theme of nature's revenge, we have a great talk coming up on Monday on design and dialogue. We're going to have Alice Story Lichtenstein uh, with us, who is the head of the Schloss Hollenegg design program. And she's going to be talking about her project Walden, which of course is an allusion to the Thoreau book. Uh, and we'll also have with us Marlene Huiso, who is a uh, designer in residence, has been a designer in residence there working on issues of biodesign. So come back on Monday for more Nature's Revenge. And I just wanna um, uh, say, James, that I am totally signed on to the idea that you are the self-effacing Elvis of architecture. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. And thanks everyone for listening in. Uh, join us again uh, on Monday for more great conversations on the Design and Dialogue series. Thanks, James. Okay, thank you.